Okay, so the recording is now on. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, Sophie Legill is a freelance botanist and an amateur entomologist as well, and she's got a keen interest in urban biodiversity. So we're going to, it was going to be really interesting to explore her talk, which is all about more than weeds, really nice title, all about the flora of London's pavements. And I know that's the thing that a lot of people interested in botany in London spend quite a lot of time looking down and looking at pavements. So it's going to be really great to find out more about what we might find. So I'm going to hand over now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over now to Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, just a minute. I'm sharing my screen. Perfect. Can everyone see my screen fine? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for having me tonight. Um, as I said, I mean, you know, um, earlier on, I'm really pleased with, with the turnout. And to be honest, it seems to really mimic, you know, the attention that I've had since I've started this project. So I launched the project at a very challenging time. Um, earlier this year, you know, in spring, uh, when everyone was in lockdown or was about to go in, in, in lockdown. Um, so it's, it's been really, uh, really interesting, you know, watching what has happened with, with the project. Um, so I hope my talk is interesting tonight. I'm obviously going to talk about the flora of London's pavement, but I'm also going to talk about more generally how we can, you know, make those plants more accepted, um, how we can get those plants, um, you know, more, more, more widely grown, more widely accepted um, in, in our cities. Um, so I know there are people in, in, in uh, attending who are not from London. Um, and I want to say really this talk is universal. It's not, you know, specifically about, about London, um, even though this is where I live and, and you know, this is, this is the environment I launched a project in. But it's really universal, I think. So I'm going to start very briefly with a small history of, um, you know, about weeding and urban weeds um, with obviously, you know, focus about, about London. Um, then I'll go into the diversity of pavement plants. So how, you know, how many plants they are, the type of plants, things like that. Um, then I'll, I'll um, do a very short, um, uh, you know, a, a few slides about what weeds can teach us. So, you know, why those plants potentially are, are, are important for ourselves. Um, obviously, a question that I get asked a lot of the time is, are pavement plant, you know, useful? Are they important? And I think, you know, when we talk about um, a city, the life of a city, um, knowing why that nature is potentially important is, is, um, is key. And finally, and this is probably a bit more applied botany, I would say, is can we learn to live with those plants? Um, you know, can, can we transform this, the streets of London? Should we, and how can we do this? Um, so as uh, Mary said before, please post your questions in the chat um, or, or ask, ask them after the talk. Um, if we haven't got the time to answer all questions, um, I'm very happy to um, reply to questions by social media or by email. Um, you can have a look at my website. I will put the link um, in the chat afterwards. Um, so I'll start with a very, very, um, small historical outlook. So this is a picture of Canary Wharf. Um, I lived there for uh, 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 some time on the 16th floor, which was a very interesting um, experience. Um, so when we look at the streets of London, you know, when you walk in London nowadays, um, it tends to be dominated by gray, by concrete, by stone. Um, so, you know, you will, we, we will see trees, you'll see, you know, street trees, um, you'll see parks, um, you'll see potentially, you know, a little bit of greenery with flower beds or pocket parks, but in general, the pavement tend to be dominated by, by grey or, or brown, you know, those sort of shade of colour. And vegetation is restricted to the areas that we have defined. And I took this picture of Canary Wharf because I think it's quite striking. You've got those buildings, you've got that row, that very neat, neatly pruned row of trees, and nothing else, there's literally no life anywhere else in those, you know, in those streets and on that, um, on that square. So everything, you know, that grows outside of the spaces that we have defined is defined as a weed and usually removed. So I wanted to find a bit, a bit more about, you know, whether our cities were always that way or whether this is, you know, something that is, that happened in the, in the 21st century and whether this is a, a kind of a modern um, issue. Um, so, you know, when we talk about a weed, 
um, as, I, as I said, weed is a plant that is considered undesirable in a particular situation, a plant that's growing in the wrong place. But when you look at the street, sometimes you find, you know, a plant that is potentially a garden plant and it's just removed and, you know, sprayed in a particular place because it's not where it should be. It's not where we think it should be. Um, so I took the example of that little dialogue, for example, you know, this is an escaped, obviously, plant. It would be perfectly acceptable in a window box or in a hanging basket, but on the street, you know, this is going to get sprayed. Why is the question. Um, so weeding, I mean, a very, very, very brief um, historical outlook on this. Um, weeds obviously became a problem when man mankind started to grow and domesticate white plants to produce food, though this is, you know, when the concept of weed appeared. And as a result of, you know, so many migration, crop were, you know, grown around the world, they started, people started moving around, plants spread around the glo globe. And so some plants, you know, which potentially were very rare in a particular area or did not exist, became more abundant. And nowadays, you know, something like um, hairy bittercress, which is very common weed in, in gardens, um, is found all around the world. So it's, it's a ubiquitous weed, which is found, you know, on the pavements of London, but also found in fields in, in India or even, in, you know, in Australia. So this is, you know, the sort of plant that, that has uh, conquered the world, I'd like to say. In cities, well, I've found very, very little um, literature about London. So I'm sorry, this is going to be slightly out of the London focus, but from literature and historical records. Um, so for, so for example, street names in some European cities, we know that the streets of our cities used to be filled with plants. Um, so for example, there's, there's a nettle street in Paris. And when you look at you know, some old books, you find out that actually you know, those, those, that particular street um, had a very high you know, nitrogen content because people would use to throw things in the street. And so nettles were growing very, very well in that street. Um, whether it was in Roman or Tudor times, the evidence that you can find you know, in writing is that weeding was, was a, a, you know, a very difficult activity, which used to be undertaken by children, by slaves, or by women. And as you can see here on that key, for example, in, in, in the Netherlands, um, you know, women scraping all the weeds from, from that key. And there's sort of similar evidence from, you know, from London that you can see. Um, it used to be, yeah, women, children. Um, it was a very, very demanding job. But that, that's what that what's used to happen. So in the 19th century, you know, cities expanded. Um, you know, when you look at the progress of London, what used to be orchard became streets, Victorian streets and, and, and um, you know, pavements. Um, and obviously paved streets, um, well, weeds became more of a problem because we decided, you know, that those, um, those area would, would be dedicated to concrete and, and stone. Um, so people started to look for alternative uh, to remove what is said in one particular publication, the very injurious as well as unsightly plant growth between cobblestones. Um, and I found um, a, a, in, a, in a book a recipe, which apparently is a French recipe, but it was used in London. Um, so it's a method to kill grass that grows in garden alleys and between cobblestones um, using lime and sulfur. And it's so strong that it, they say that will purge the soil of rebel herbs for several years. So you can imagine, you know, the, the strengths of potentially, you know, such a weeding product. Um, to some, however, weeds were opportunities. Um, and this engraving on, on the left is something I, I quite like. And if you, if you look, I don't know if you can see, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Um, so the, the engraving is of a man called the groundsel man. So groundsel is, you know, a very, very common weed in gardens, also on pavements and tree pits. And underneath of that, that title, it says chickweed and groundsel. Um, and in fact, you know, groundsel men were apparently really popular in Victorian times. So these were men who, whose job would be to go around gardens, around pavements, um, you know, parks, um, industrial areas, collecting plants from such as chickweed, groundsel, um, sow thistle, you know, typical weeds. They would collect them, carry them in baskets, and offer them for sale um, to rich Victorians for their cage birds. You know, Victorians used to have a lot of cage birds, and so they needed fresh food for them as well as, um, you know, grain. So this was, you know, a popular activity. Um, and again, it was it was a tiring job, a very low-paid job. 
Um, but you know, th to those people, the, the weeds were actually, you know, um, uh, some sort of yeah, economic activity. Um, in terms of urban biodiversity and the study of urban biodiversity, there is surprisingly very little, um, you know, records, very little evidence or publications about urban, urban plants and urban nature. Um, so I find actually um, the, the, the best example I've found is from Paris, um, but I've, you know, I haven't found something similar from London, and it's the flora of uh, Paris cobblestones. So um, there's a, you know, a botanist who actually spent a year studying specifically the plant growing between cobblestones in, in, in Paris, which I thought you know, was, was very interesting. Um, and he studied also uh, tree grids, which are very popular in, in that time, the end of the 19th century. Uh, but there, there's been you know, very little um, that I, I could find from London. So if anyone from um, the London Natural History Society has you know, evidence of that, I'll be, I'll be delighted to, um, to hear about it. Um, obviously, at the turn of the century, uh, the chemical industry, you know, became really prominent. The weed killers appeared, um, like the famous Eureka, which was arsenic. As you can imagine, this resulted in quite a few poisoning, as well as, you know, the damage to the soils. Um, and then with the Second World War, um, 2,4-D and glyphosate um, slightly later, uh, which became, you know, the, the most widely used weed killer all around, all around um, the UK. And when you look at, you know, I mean, this is not a tweet from London, um, but I've got some other examples, you know, I mean, this, this is usually what happens in so many streets. Um, the, the weeds are just being killed. And the reason, you know, that most councils give, I've been working a little bit with councils in London, and the reason, you know, the list of reason is quite long. So it ranges from weeds look dirty, um, they make an area look neglected. They attract pests like rats. So if you have weed, you have rats. Um, they cause allergies and they're ugly. Usually, you know, people have got this image of a pavement shouldn't be for plants. If you want to see plants, you go to a park or a garden, but a pavement should be weed free or plant free, which is quite interesting. So sadly, you know, images like this, th these are a couple of, you know, social media images from, from London. There's Wentworth, and there's Camden, Lambeth, all sorts of council in London. You know, it's not particularly restrict to a, restricted to a particular one. And people are complaining about this. But with the lockdown this year, something quite extraordinary happened. Um, and I mean, you've probably all noticed it with, you know, the lockdown, um, councils didn't send their staff to do the spring spraying, which usually happens in April or May in London. Um, and so they didn't send their staff out, you know, to do that. And as a result of that, where we started, you know, to have plants appearing in, in the streets. Um, so I've, I took, you know, some example, this, this is quite a pretty one, I have to say, um, on, on the left here. And on the right, it's, um, sorry, it's a Daily Mail article, but it's an article from um, uh, Rome where they had the same sort of thing, you know, um, there was no footfall. So the plants were able to grow as well because people were not walking on them. And plants, you know, started to appear in, in, in those streets, those historical places where they hadn't been seen for hundreds of years, either because they had been sprayed or because they were removed before that. So, you know, something happened and really, when I launched this project, um, I didn't, you know, obviously I wasn't expecting this to happen and people to be stuck inside and things like that. But there's clearly be a change, you know, people want to know about that nature. Um, I've had emails of people, you know, um, saying, I finally, you know, discovered that plants can grow in, in our streets. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, what was traditionally, as you mentioned quite rightly, Maria, um, you know, there's always been botanists looking for those plants, studying those plants, looking at pavements, but it's never been mainstream because you always had to look very closely or be there at the right time for them. But once they start, you know, multiplying as a result of, you know, no spraying, then people um, have a completely, or, you know, they discover something, they adopt a very different approach to, to their urban nature. So it's been very interesting. And, you know, this brings me to my next next point. Um, so this is a, a, an, an image from um, uh, Surrey Keys in, in London. Um, you know, I could have taken any, any example, to be honest. Um, and what I wanted to show is that in a very small area like this, you have so many different habitats. And this is, you know, one of the reasons why the diversity of plants um, on pavements and, you know, tree pits in cities is so important. 
Um, so you have gardens, um, you've got pond or lake, um, you've got some woodland in a park, um, then you've got, you know, some open areas in a park. Um, you've also got with the Thames, you know, that brings a specific flora. Um, if you look at, you know, paving along the Thames path, for example, you will have a completely different range of plants um, to paving if you look, you know, um, closer to, to a park or in a park, for example. Um, so all that means that you have a very, you know, wide range of habitat in a very small area. And as a result of that, this gives, they give, you know, gives plants plenty of opportunities. They are likely, um, you know, to find the right niche to, to grow. Um, they're, they're likely, you know, if they, they, they're soil tolerant plant, they're more likely to grow, you know, along the, um, along the Thames path, for example. Um, if they, they're more into sh shade or, um, you know, they, they're fine with open gravel area, then they may be able to grow, you know, in a more industrial area, for example. Um, so I think it's quite interesting, you know, the, the fact that there are so many um, potential habitats, but also that there are so many source habitats. You know, we have a huge diversity of plants in, in London. And if you look at the flora of the London area, that 1983 book, um, you know, there, there are over 2000 species. How many species do we have on London's pavements? We have no idea. There's never been a comprehensive, you know, survey of particularly plants that happen on pavement. And also it might not necessarily be an easy task because by, the, you know, because um, flora in cities evolves all the time. We get new plants arriving. They might not be invasive, obviously, you know, it, could, it can be, you know, new plants arriving with um, bird seeds or birds, yeah, or, or anything really. So the flora is constantly evolving. Um, a question that, you know, people always ask me is, what are the most common plants? So I try to, you know, um, identify the most common ones for me, but you have to realize that it can change, you know, depending on where you are in London. The most common plants for me in Southeast London might not be the same in, if you live in, you know, in, in the East, for example. Um, so I've chosen things like the pedigree of the wall, which often does, you know, what it says <laughs> and grows on walls. Um, groundsel, as we've seen before, you know, this, this was a, a common pavement weed in the 19th century, it still is. Um, Herb Robert, uh, very hard to miss. Um, shepherd's pears, quite difficult to, to miss as well. Um, and also, you know, it happens uh, throughout the year, you can find it easily in, in winter. Um, sm smooth south thistle um, is quite a common, common weed um, in, um, on, on the pavements and tree pits. Um, chickweed, another one which I've mentioned before, um, you know, with the groundsel men. Um, Thalcress um, is a very common plant where I am. Um, and finally, we've got red dead nettle, um, which, you know, might, might be more sometimes seen more as, as um, a woodland, woodland plant, but um, I've, I've seen it very, very often in, on my pavement. And finally, uh, creeping wood sorrel. Uh, which you know spreads so easily with it with its seeds, um, and that can cover hu huge areas of um, of pavement, but it's rarely rarely a problem. So you know this is my selection. It's very difficult. I think it'd be really interesting, you know, to have a comprehensive survey of of plants specifically growing on pavement. We have a lot of data, um, you know, on and records. And botanists, um, people from the, the London Natural History Society have been you know going on pavements and recording plants but we don't necessarily know whether they are on the pavement. So I think it'd be really interesting to, uh, to do a, a specific survey on that. Um, tree pits, as I've mentioned them, um, offer a very interesting habitat too, um, because obviously they, they offer soil, which you might not find, and deeper soil, which you may not find, um, you know, in a, in a, in a, on a pavement. Um, and also, you know, they're, they're, they've got specific challenges um, whether it's uh, trampling, uh, whether it's dog, dog peeing, that sort of thing. So, so they're, they're, they're quite interesting places if you want to botanize. Um, obviously, you know, the plants I've mentioned before um, are quite common there, but you, you can also find um, things like wall barley, which is, oops, sorry, um, which, which I find quite often, you know, in, um, on, um, on, in tree pits. Um, and I've, I did a talk for the um, Urban Tree Festival earlier, uh, the, earlier this year about um, you know the flora of tree pits um, and actually find you when you do a bit of research you actually find out that those plants could help um, you know tree health uh, so when, when you've got those plants um, you know growing it could potentially retain some moisture and help the trees um, you know particularly in, in, in cities like London where drought in summer is such a, an issue 
um, if we had more plants you know, growing um, at the foot of those trees, potentially this could help their survival um, in, in summer by retaining some moisture. So I think this is quite interesting, particularly as many councils remove them. It's not all about natives, you know, most of the plants I've showed before um, were, were native or, or, or archaeophyte at least, um, but the pavements are a formidable opportunity for many of our garden plants. Um, so it ranges from South African lobelias. Um, if you look around pubs specifically, um, and I've noticed that in so many parts of London, if you look around pubs, you're likely to find, um, you know, self-seeded uh, self plants from last year's hanging basket. So things like pansies, um, lobelias um, are very common there. Um, I found things like bacopas as well, uh, which is a, a white flowered typical, you know, summer plant. And it's very interesting when you think about the origin of those plants because lobelia, they come from the slopes of mountains in South Africa. So, you know, when you think about it, a pavement is quite a similar sort of environment. It's rocky. Um, they can find, they can send roots quite deep, you know, into the pavement uh, to get some water, um, which is the same, you know, in their native environment. So those plants are actually quite well adapted to, you know, living in, in cities. Um, and the second one uh, that I wanted to show here, this is in the tree pit, um, and that's um, Claytonia, which is a plant from North America. So this has been in the UK um, for probably 100, 150 years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, again, it's not a native plant, but it's perfectly well adapted, you know, to, to living in, in cities. And that some of them are very short lived, lobelias are annual. Um, so, you know, they, they're, as I said, they're transit transitory. You might see them a year and you, you won't see them the next year, but they all contribute to, to the diversity of, of plants in, in a city. Um, well, what pavement plants can tell us about our cities? I've already, you know, touched a little bit on that with, for example, you know, plants coming from gardens. Um, and I could go and on and on for, for several hours talking about this. So I'm going to have to, <laughs> to be quite brief. Um, this is obviously the flower of the London area, which is a really good book if you're interested, you know, in the evolution of, of our flora. Um, and so they, they can tell us about the history of a place. They can tell us about previous land use. So how, you know, how the soil evolved, um, you know, brownfield land typically, for example, has um, very specific characteristics. Um, they can tell us things about the architecture. And this is something very interesting, which I've noticed, depending on where you are in London, you might see different plants because the pavements, the material of the pavement isn't the same. Um, so you, you'll have, you know, a different range of plants growing and adapted to that particular um, part of pavements. Um, obviously centuries of trade, you know, some plants arrived in London um, with, you know, the trade and some plants actually arrived around the UK through London, through ships coming, um, you know, and bringing grain or wool, which had some seeds in it. Um, it can also tell us about climate change and studying those plants could be really interesting and important for the future. Um, and also invasion. Uh, and, you know, this is something uh, that, that we don't necessarily realize, but many plants when they come, you know, when they arrive in the, in, to, in the country, they arrive via our cities and they, they get established in cities first and then they disperse um, from, from the cities. Um, so, you know, potentially studying those plants could have a wider impact uh, than, than just, you know, the flora of London. Um, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just take a few examples. And the first one I wanted to take is Rose Bay Widow Herb. Um, so um, you can't see very well because that was, that's a screenshot from an old film from the 1950s. Uh, but that, that uh, screenshot um, is, shows the Barbican estate before it was redeveloped. Um, and it, apparently in the Barbican, and it was really interesting because I presented that slide in another talk and a woman sent me um, a screen, or a screen, or well, just a, a picture of a painting that she was given for her wedding, which was taken, um, well, which was you know done around the Barbican estate in the 1940s. And you can see huge swath of um, fireweed. So that particular plant, um, which in fact in London was nicknamed bombweed because it grew so well on the bomb sites. Um, so typically this is a plant, the pioneer plant, so it will grow, you know, when the forest has been cut um, or, you know, when an area has been cleared. And in London, this happened with bombsites. Um, so you could see that plant growing very, very well, and you know, around bombsites like um, what will, would become the Barbican later. 
So I think this is very important. And you can see the herbarium specimen here, uh, the flora of London bottom sites in 1950, which is quite fascinating. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, it's, it's really fascinating to, uh, to have a look into that. And obviously plants are spread through lots of different ways. Um, so we've got things, you know, like tires, we don't think about that, you know, car tires, um, lorries, um, animals, obviously, you know, who move around, um, and particularly birds. Um, so on the, on the right here, we've got the apple of Peru, um, which is, um, you know, quite widely um, spread by birds. Um, and of course, railways. Um, so the typical example is the Oxford ragwort, which was spread around the UK um, through the railways. Um, another plant, sadly, which is spreading a lot, if you, you know, if you, if you go around the, the station, for example, Clapham Junction has a huge amount of Buddleia, um, you know, Buddleia rounds. Um, and this is potentially in a plant that could be a problem in the future because it can spread so well via our, our train lines. Um, the picture on the left, I, I thought quite interesting. This is rapeseed. Um, and it's Leicester Square. Uh, that tree is, is literally um, just opposite Leicester Square. Um, you know, how did that plant arrive in the tree pits in, in Leicester Square? You know, nobody knows. And I found it really fascinating with, you know, pavement plants and urban plants. You have no idea potentially how they, how they arrived, which I think is very interesting. Um, as I mentioned, you know, earlier, climate change, potentially studying those urban plants could help us, you know, uh, understand the effects of climate change a bit more, whether those plants, you know, move around. Uh, so, for example, something, you know, that is, that is protected in the UK, actually, but that is sprayed on the pavements in London by council is Jersey cudweed. So that plant is actually, um, you know, classed as a rare plant overall in the UK. And on the pavements of London, it's becoming, you know, very, very common. I, I see, I see it on a daily basis around, you know, where I live. Um, and, you know, potentially, um, this is a plant that is being helped by climate change. Um, there are also potential uh, uh, co other causes, like the fact that it's being re-imported from other countries via the trade. You know, we, we import plants all the time, for example, and potentially we could be re-importing that plant that had disappeared in, in the past. Um, another one which I've noticed, you know, increasing, uh, but I don't really have, you know, a reason for that is really saxifrage. Um, you know, it's, it's really increasing on pavements um, and there are potential um, ideas that it could be resistant to glyphosate. So, you know, even though it's being sprayed, it could be resisting to it. And so as, as a result, um, you know, just um, being able to survive and to thrive, which it can do in the past. Um, so some pavement plants we know they've been, you know, they've been spreading. Um, and I think it's very important to have a look at those plants and record them because we don't know whether they might become invasive. So a plant that you may notice all around London, a uh, Mexican fleabane, um, at the moment, it's not considered to be invasive, but it can spread quite well. You know, it, it can spread really widely. So could that plant become invasive in, in the future? Um, you know, we, we don't know and we won't know until we, we study it and we are able to, you know, potentially track its effects. Um, it doesn't seem to be at the moment. It hasn't been, you know, classed as, as invasive, but who knows in, in the future. And I just wanted to show, you know, a, a, a quick image. Again, this is not London focus, but this is a plant that is very common. You're 100% you're likely to have seen it and passed it if you're not into grasses. Um, this is Waterbends, Polyprogon viridis, and um, I borrowed Mark Spencer's picture. I hope he, he won't, um, <laughs> uh, won't mind. Um, but this, you know, this is the distribution before the 1980s and the distribution, you know, as of today or, you know, this year. So you can see the huge difference, you know, in how that plant has been spreading. And you can see it's been spreading around, you know, particularly around cities. Um, again, you know, not a plant that is causing any problem now but who knows what may happen in, in the future. So something that people always ask me is, you know, are those pavement plants actually bringing anything to London or any other city where they may be growing? And, you know, there are so many different roles when you think about it. But again, the problem is they haven't been quantified. So it's very difficult to say, you know, um, this plant is, is good because um, you know, it's all potential roles, but they have never been quantified. So I think this is something, you know, that will need to be addressed in, in the future. Um, so obviously insects, you've got pollination, you've got direct effect, which are not difficult to see. And, you know, this has an impact on obviously insect populations, 
um, which I know there are quite a few in the, in the <laughs> in NHS. Um, and also indirect effects like um, fruit production, you know, berry production, um, things like this, which has an impact then on the distribution in, and the abundance of, of birds and, you know, mammals, uh, small mammals as well. Um, so whether we talk about, you know, cultivated or white plants, we always hear about plants for pollinators, but we have to think about the fact that many of those plants are essential to insects before they actually flower. Um, you know, where, when, when they're in, in leaf and where they can be um, uh, food for many larvae and caterpillars. Um, so, you know, this is something that sometimes councils, particularly if, you, if you're, you know, talking to councils in London, um, don't tend to understand. But we've, we've, you know, the plants have stopped flowering. That's not for that, you know, it's, it's not a good reason to, to remove them necessarily once they've stopped flowering. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite <laughs> interesting. And, and I did, I, I had to look at, you know, some statistics. And if you take all the um, phytophagus uh, insects, so insects that feed on plants, you actually find out that about 75% of insects in, in Britain um, only feed on one plant family. Um, so when you think about a city where you potentially have lots of different plant families, if you remove, you know, a particular uh, family, the, that, in, that particular insect might become locally extinct. And you can think, you know, it's fine that there, there, there are other plants, but potentially no, um, you know, the ins some insects are very, very um, adapted to a particular family or to a particular plant. So we also have to think about it, even, you know, when managing urban environments, it has, a, it has a, an impact as well. Um, and bird food is not only about insects, it's also about the birds. Um, and I took that example, again, it's, it's not a London one. I, I wish we could see one in London that would, I think that would convince potentially councils, but uh, this is a hoopoo um, that was seen um, feeding on pavement plants. So sometimes, you know, people say pavement plants useless, but actually, you know, there is concrete evidence that those plants attract insects and potentially this can have, you know, an impact on, on the birds as well. So, and well, this is another interesting one. Again, one where there is evidence from, you know, scientific literature, but very um, actual evidence in the field, you know, in, in, a, in, in a street. Um, and so there, there is evidence that um, many of our common plants like yarrow, wallflower, um, smooth sow thistle, um, many of the legumes as well, can remove some of our um, atmospheric pollutants. So things, you know, that come from um, the car exhausts. Um, so heavy metals as well, um, like ribwort, this is a picture taken in central London. And, you know, potentially those very innocent looking plants could actually have a larger impact than what we think on our urban environments um, and on the air, uh, the air quality in, in our environments. So this is, you know, something that I'm putting here. Obviously, I haven't, you know, I haven't done any study and there's little evidence in, in literature apart from lab evidence, but potentially this could, you know, could be, um, it, it shouldn't be neglected is what I would say. So this brings me to my um, last point. Can we learn to live with those plants? So around Euro um, European cities, you know, when you look at Paris, Berlin, um, this is starting in London, um, initiatives to let those plants live are, are spreading. Um, in the UK, this, the last statistics I have, which is probably slightly a bit better now, um, that was from two years ago, is that 98% of councils still use glyphosate to remove those pavement plants. And in London, um, this is the case for many councils. Um, one of the few which have, you know, they've started taking, uh, taking um, some uh, measures. So Hammersmith and Fulham um, have stopped using it since 2016, for example but they still you know, remove the weeds using alternative methods. Um, Lambeth is committed to phasing out glyphosate in 2021. But more importantly, and this, I think this is quite an interesting example, which I'm gonna to come to you in a minute. Um, the borough of Hackney is trialing glyphosate free zone, but also weeding free zone. And this is obviously going, going to interest some botanists. Um, so the, the initiative that Hackney decided is to uh, trial some areas, a particular area, which would be um, weeding free. So they tried it and they started this last year. Um, and the focus was both on health, you know, we always hear about how weed killers are bad for health, but they're actually also bad for biodiversity. And weeding in general is, you, you know, you remove 
um, food source for insects, pollution removal potential, things like that. So they started this trial and I've been helping the team over there a little bit, um, you know, doing some survey and, and plant listing. And what I found out, so these are pictures from last, taken last week. Um, so it's, you know, not at the best time of the year, obviously it's already quite late. And what I found out in this street, which is about 400 meters long, is 62 plant species of 26 different families, um, you know, in, in a street um, on, you know, simply on, on the pavement. So I haven't looked at, you know, gardens or things like that. This was purely on the pavements where they have stopped spraying. And if you think of it again about my, you know, old statistics of 75% of insects feeding on a single plant family, then potentially, you know, that figure is an innocent and it could have a real impact on, you know, our the biodiversity, the local biodiversity. And, you know, I've, I've had contacts with local residents and the local residents at all, I've, I've seen, seen way more butterflies since, you know, since that we've got more plants in, in the streets. And, you know, it's a bit anecdotal, but, you know, potentially there could be a real impact there of, um, you know, leaving those plants, those plants to grow. Um, so um, I just wanted to say a word about the French example, because I'm, I'm familiar with it. And in France, glyphosate was banned from all public spaces. Um, so they can't use it anymore on pavements. Um, as a private gardener, you can't, you can no longer use it as well. Um, and so it was, it was quite a challenge, particularly for big cities. You know, smaller cities, people are more likely to, you know, help weed and um, you've got community groups, things like that. But for large cities like Paris or Lyon, um, which are, you know, quite close to what you'll see in London, this was quite a challenge. And they tried to reverse, you know, that being a constraint as being an opportunity to um, get more biodiversity in the city. So this is an example on, on the right, it's a campaign. So they had huge billboards in, in the city, um, you know, signs in magazines and newspapers, things like that. Um, and, and what, I mean, if you translate, it says, when vegetation is coming back, um, it's that life, life is, is, um, is, is healthy. And I think that's quite beautiful, you know, the fact that they've turned it round and tried to convince people. Um, so they said, um, we are our allies, which I, I quite like. <laughs> um, so this idea, you know, what they've been trying to do really is moving away from blanket weeding, you know, we remove everything from a selective approach and adapting public spaces for plants. Um, so you, you don't want, you know, to um, people to trip on the plants and um, you don't want, you know, problem for access, but at the same time, you want to try and maximize biodiversity. Um, and potentially, this can also have an impact on other, um, you know, actions and it could help us manage spaces more sustainably. And when you think about London, for example, you know, there is still pesticide use in some of the parks um, and potentially, you know, accepting more weeds can displace pests. This is being done, you know, in, in organic agriculture. So why couldn't we adapt those practices in our cities? Um, and you can also reduce the need to weed by using plants. So areas where you would traditionally have gravel, um, you could, you know, instead um, have um, some um, small growing plants and that would help uh, reduce the need to weed. So it, it's about adapting a, a different approach. So when I launched more than weeds earlier this year, um, I didn't expect, you know, that kind of um, success, I would say, uh, because that's been, it's been really the case, you know, all that much interest, particularly from councils in London, you know, have been approached by several councils. Um, so I think it's, you know, the, the, the lockdown has, has obviously changed people's approach with nature. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, with over, you know, the coming year, uh, to be able to do a lot more um, to, you know, to encourage people to tolerate more weeds and, um, and also, you know, encourage people to rec record them. And this is my final point about how you can help. So whether, I mean, most people here don't seem to be member of the, the London Natural History Society and might not be familiar with recording, but I want, what I want to say to people is even if you're not familiar, there, there is plenty of, you know, help available um, to, if you're struggling to identify your plants, um, you know, there are citizen sciences websites, um, guidebooks, um, initiatives like Wildflower Hour on Twitter, which is really, really good to, you know, help you identify your plants. Um, and once you identify your plants, where well, you should be recording them, because if you don't record your plant, then we won't be able to, you know, sci the, uh, scientists won't be able to, um, to, to know where they are and understand them, 
and use them for, for, um, for research. Um, so there are very easy you know, ways to do that, even with your phone. So what I want to say to people, you know, if you're in a, in a city, in, in a street, on the pavement, and you see an interesting plant, um, just record it because, you know, you don't know what that may be useful for. So this is, you know, my final point. And I'll finish with um, something quite, quite uh, nice, which is weed art. And potentially this is something that I would like to see a bit more in London. Um, it's, you know, accepting white plants as, you know, something that could be not only it's not only about neglect, but it's something that could be used, um, you know, to, for, by artists uh, to produce, you know, a bit of street art, for example, graffiti. Um, I really like this, you know, to happen in, in London because I think it would very much help um, convince people and also convince authorities um, that those plants are here to be studied, loved, and enjoyed by everyone. So thank you very much. Um, for um, listening. I hope uh, I've, I've seen many questions appearing, so yes. <laughs> I hope I'll have time to answer them all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was an excellent talk and really wide ranging. You covered an awful lot of ground in that short time. I loved the weed art at the end. That yes. was that's just really clever, very creative and very clever. And it just reframes the way you might look at those plants when you kind of see them incorporated and thought about in a slightly different way. And I like the way that you were thinking about, you know, what was happening in different places. It was very interesting learning about France. Um, and a different sort of approach that seems to be taken there. So that was absolutely fantastic. Um, we're gonna go on to questions because there are a lot of them. So we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, Anka, are you okay to start going through some of the questions? Yeah, I've just kind of written down a few. Um, so um, there was one question, um, Sophie, which I think might be of interest for quite a few people. What is the most intriguing or interesting pavement plant that you found in London? Um, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, too many. Um, possibly um, it's, it's, it's not the most in interesting, it's just the prettiest and it's a garden plant actually. Um, it's called um, hare's tail, I think. It's got, it's got those lovely, it's a grass. Um, which has got those lovely kind of pom-pom like flowers, um, the Guris of Artis, that's what it's called, the Latin name. Um, and when I saw that, I thought it was so pretty, you know, it, it just brought a, a smile uh, that I think, you know, potentially, you don't, you, I mean, obviously I'm a botanist, but you don't necessarily need to have a look at those plants in a scientific way. You know, I've, I've, I was really pleased with More Than Weeds because I got, me, um, I got you know, news reports in, in things like Hello Magazine, you know, which is not your typical botanical audience. So I really want to, you know, people to enjoy plants in whatever way they think is best for them. So, yeah, I would say. <laughs> um, we also have, there's a question about how to get children into IDing plants. Now, the, the questioner, um, Claire, was kind of, Wondering because obviously there are safeguarding issues when you have children, so you can't always use technology. Yeah. So, is there a way to get children into IDing plants without using um, mobile phones and and whatnot? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I won't be able to say too much about this, but I'm basically working on a book, uh, oh. which is going to be for children, um, uh, Flora. So um, I think that's going to be quite exciting. Um, but, you know, in, in the meantime, um, I think it's, it's always best, you know, to have a look at, um, um, you know, some of the very simple book, I think BSBI, if you have a look at the BSBI website, they have um, a range of, you know, books for different audiences. So if you can start with that, um, I think it's, it's probably a good idea. I've, I've, to be honest, I've been contacted by a, a large number of schools. Um, you know, uh, teachers saying, do you have any resource? And obviously one of the problem is I'm doing this completely, you know, on the side and voluntarily. So if I had more time, you know, to be able to develop things, I would, I would love to, uh, but it's quite, it's quite difficult, um, yeah. you know, doing this um, because I have too many, uh, too many, in, too much interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, then something slightly different. Um, you know, you, you're talking about kind of getting councils to, ch uh, to change their viewpoints on weeds found um, not only in, in the London um, area, but elsewhere. Uh, but, but one question was raised, should councils be treating natives and non-native plants differently? 
Um, my answer on that, um, I think it's always a very, um, you know, touchy point, the, the idea of non-native native. native. Uh, my idea on that, if you have a look, you know, many plants in our cities, spontaneous plants are technically not native. Um, you know, they've, they've, they've been potentially in the UK for 200, 300 years, uh, but they're technically non native. So I think there's a danger, you know, with separating those plants. And potentially, if they are close to natives, then they will be very useful to our, you know, insects and very well adapted to living in our cities. Um, so I think um, I would say, I would say no. Um, however, one of the issues, um, you know, with, with, I mean, and something I see all the time in London is for example, you know, that when they plant, when you have, you know, a new planting being done, there's absolutely no concern about biodiversity and the role um, that those plants could have. So, you know, formiums is a plant that is planted everywhere in London, which has actually very, very little value to any insects. Um, so, you know, I would like councils to have a, a, a bit more biodiversity focused approach without necessarily thinking, you know, native, non-native, um, I think this is this is the idea. Obviously, some of our pavement plants, um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we should be leaving everything to, to grow. Buddleias, for example, uh, is a typical plant, you know, that has actually very little uh, or potentially very little, you know, wider value. And it's also damaging uh, to pavement. So potentially this is a plant, you know, that could be removed in priority. This is what's being done uh, quite often in, in, in France, for example. They remove, you know, specific plants and they leave the rest. I mean, that kind of leads into another, there was a sort of a little discussion and some questions um, flying around. So I'm going to try to formulate a question from some of the comments um, because, you know, we do see, you know, a lot of pavement plants and some of them can be destructive to walls yeah. and to the street and stuff. So what would, what can be done about that to kind of mitigate against any potential damage or at least people might have worries that their walls might start crumbling because they've got too many um, plants growing in the cracks and what not. I think there's a lot of misinformation on that. You know, people think that moss, for example, is going to destroy their walls, um, yeah. which actually is, is potentially quite damaging because it removes some of, some of the water, you know, potentially, uh, and absorbs some of the rainwater. So it could actually have a prote protective role. Um, I have been basing myself on English heritage guidance. There is um, an, a guidance document from English heritage, um, which you know I think is, is has been quite well documented about what to do with um, vegetation on walls. Um, so it's not specific to pavements; it's more for walls. But I think this is quite a good document, and the, the general guidance is remove anything that has got weedy roots. So you know tree seedlings, um, bud layers. Um, plants you know that have potentially quite damaging uh, damaging roots um there are other plants with tap roots so smooth sow thistle is one for example which has got a tap root and it has the potential to lift the pavement so it's been studied again in the lab um and it's been so shown you know to lift the pavement um but um you know how much of that is actually damaging compared to normal damage you know footfall um, and also things like trees, you know, a lot of the time those plants grow where you have, you know, tree roots where the pavement is already lifted. So how much damage is due to those plants and how much is due, you know, to, to, um, to, the, um, uh, to the tree roots. So sometimes it's quite difficult. What I would like to, you know, what I'd like to say to people is if you have, you know, something that seems to be growing really fast and seems to have quite a strong root, then potentially remove, remove it if you think, you know, that it could have um, so, some and could do some damage. Uh, most of our pavement plants are actually annuals or, or you know, perennials with um, very small, you know, roots. Um, so they shouldn't be posing much problem. Thank you. Um, and um, well, you kind of you kind of touched on this um, in your talk, but is there a particular platform that you would recommend over others, or maybe are there several platforms? Um, for, for people to record plants, particularly people who may not be as experienced or you know, are still learning to identify um, pavement plants? I think, um, I mean, I've, I've quoted, you know, in, 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 um, I, I, didn't, I didn't spend much time you know, to, um, to have a look at them, um, but, but things like um, I record, I think is, is you know, the one I use the most um, because it's so useful. You can have, you know, you can do it on your phone. 
um, and also um, you can you can you know have a look at your past records. Um, however, you know you need to be able to know what your plant is already. Um, so I would you know um, recommend if you want an app that does that, um, then use iNaturalist because then you'll have suggestions about you know what your plant might be. Um, you could also use some of the um, identification apps. You know there are a few apps which um, can you know give you a quick idea of what your plant is. Um, but for recording, it might be worth you know very verifying what your plant, the name of your plant uh, before that. Um, if you're on social media, particularly um, Facebook and Twitter, as I said, the the Wildflower Hour um, uh, initiative is is really wonderful because it's botanists helping people you know identify their plants and also giving you little tricks you know to to identify your plant. Um, so I think it's it's potentially quite good if you're interested in you know knowing knowing a little more about the plants as well. Thank you. Anka, we've probably got time for maybe one or two more quick questions. So if you've yeah, got something. Uh, there is something here. Sorry, it just keeps popping around. Um, it's about tree pits. Um, so somebody's written, David Blundell has written, many people actively cultivate tree pits. Yep. Would you have any particular recommendations with respect to uh, biodiversity? Um, I have a blog post on my website, if you have a look, on tree pits, which I wrote specifically uh, for, for, you know, tree pits, because um, I wanted to find out, actually, you know, whether spraying had an impact on those tree pits, and it does, on, on those trees, and it does. Uh, with regards to cultivating tree pits, um, I think, you know, many people are starting to, to do this, and I've, I've seen some really bad things on, on social media. Um, you know, there's, there's the potential of um, a damage to the tree roots, you know, many trees have got very shallow roots. So if you start digging to cultivate them, potentially you could damage the, the roots of the tree. Um, also, if you use um, some plants like grasses, take up a lot of water. So they could actually be taking, you know, too much water from the tree. Um, so countries like Switzerland um, have um, created, um, you know, little guides which tell you um, which plants to grow and which plants you shouldn't be growing, things like that. So I think there's, you know, definitely potential um, to, um, to improve uh, the, the guidance for, for people to do this. Um, in general, the idea is to, you have to, to avoid having, putting soil um, just close to the, the tree because that will, you know, uh, bury basic, basically the base of the tree. So that's quite bad as well. Uh, so there are a few things, but in general, it's not a bad thing uh, because it can help, um, you know, if you water your plants then you water the tree at the same time. So in terms of stewardship, it's actually quite a good thing. It's just, it just needs to be done, you know, in, in the right way. So growing things like Mediterranean plants, which don't need too much water, is potentially quite a good thing. That's great. So we, we, we are near, almost on 7.30, so we are, we're we going to need to come to a, an end now. You said you were going to give us a, an email contact, so that if people did have questions that they could um, yeah. follow up, we're happy to do with that. That would be great if you can pop that in the chat for us. 